Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and today it is my pleasure to have Ray Brem with us. Ray, also known as the Summit Guy, is a USA Today and Wall Street Journal bestselling author and entrepreneur. He helps entrepreneurs build their platforms via books and virtual summits. He's a member of the National Academy of Bestselling Authors and the National Association of Experts, Writers, and Speakers. He's been featured on America's Top Authors, CNN, CNBC, Fox News, and USA Today. Ray, it's so great to have you on the show. So I just uh, panicked and drank some coffee and choked on it as you're giving me the intro, but uh, <laughs> that's how nervous I am about this, but I, oh. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Uh, and I never do fun. that. I'm a coffee guy. I drink it all day long, but I'm like, you know, maybe it's time to <clears> stop <throat> drinking it all day long. You know, there are no coincidences. <laughs> That's probably true. It's like, all right, we might as well, well we, address we that first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you did say before we started recording, you're here to get coached or something like that. So uh, here's my first coaching tip for you. Stop the coffee. This is uh, instant results here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, there are two types of people. There are moderators and there are abstainers. For me, I am an abstainer. I have to abstain in order to like get off of the thing. For example, do less time on my mobile phone. I'll have to delete the apps that I end up spending most of my time on. You know, moderating just doesn't work for me. So are you a moderator or are you an abstainer? I think I'm a moderator, except for coffee. We'll we'll see how that plays out because I'm just, you know, that's my advice my enjoyment i guess i don't know I, my doctor said it's okay but uh you know i every year in the checkup i'm like coffee okay i don't i don't really drink much so um but for most things i do you know for instance to get things done i'll you know i'll do i'll make commitments i'll make financial commitments and invest in something that way i know it's going to get done uh so i think that would fit the moderator category in that case i'm either committing to getting it in or committing getting out by deleting it. And you're right. I mean, I, one of my habits that I try to do is, uh, you know, let's close every window except the one task we're working on on the computer because mm -hmm. there's just so many distractions, let alone. And I dropped social media a couple of years ago, kind of moderator, I guess. I learned this from Kabbalah not, not long ago, maybe a few years ago. There's the body consciousness and there's the soul consciousness. You might've heard something of, uh, similar uh but with different terminology but that basically who's who's driving the bus is it your body or is it your soul if you're craving snacks or or sugar or something your coffee your body consciousness is driving the bus not your soul consciousness and it's not so good to have your body consciousness driving the bus much better for your soul to be doing it so that's just my personal experience that makes sense so just asking yourself who's driving the bus when you're taking uncertain actions. One thing I've done that it helps uh, to get off of a bad habit is, if, especially if it's consuming something like, uh, let's say, sugar, have a glass of water first. If I'm still craving the thing after I have an entire huge glass of water, probably still do it. But if I feel satisfied now after the water, uh, I will abstain. <laughs> so. It's kind of like, uh, you know, before you do anything, then go do 10 push ups or go for a walk. In fact, I think I heard Brenda Bouchard say that, you know, don't, if you're tired, that means your body needs to go get moving, not lay down, right? So mm -hmm. go for a walk and then decide if you're still tired. Are you, are you uh, into Brendan Bouchard? Do you, do you go to a lot of his events or anything? I did years ago. I haven't been to anything lately i'm you know i've got a lot of his courses i just a lot of his certain people and he's one of them the the you know they say something that's that sticks with me one of his quotes i use in a lot of my books and so forth is you be your own best avatar because mm -hmm. i run into this a lot with, with even with my clients it's like they they you know they're let's say they're starting authors or they want to host a summit you know they're not always willing to invest in themselves but then they want others to invest in them i try to also make sure I'm living that mantra myself. So, of course, I'm probably the, I go too far that way. You know, I'm a sales guy that loves to buy. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm most a seminar junkie. I'm a yeah. online course junkie and book junkie. Which I don't think there's anything too wrong with that. You're wanting no. to learn. So if you don't want to learn, if you don't want to invest, you know, spend money, if it's because you're spending money or just don't feel like you have time to learn something else, 
you know, I want to learn from people that are lifelong learners. Tony Robbins would say that either you're learning or you're, you're growing or you're dying. If I'm, if I'm not out there improving myself, I'm, I'm shrinking. I mean, it feels like that, you know, it's a car with that, with a gas pedal and you can either push or let off, but there's not really any cruise control. I mean, especially I think for entrepreneurs that, you know, if I, if I feel stagnant for a month or two, I'm really bored or, or you know maybe i'm questioning whether i'm in the right thing so i'm always hitting the gas pedal but it's doing that sometimes you could you know you go in the wrong direction but that's okay at least you figured that out it reminds me of another brendan burchard uh quote that i just found really helpful and that is be your own power plant or uh, something to, along those lines like your power generator so what he'd explain is that you're not depleting energy by doing the thing or whatever, you're actually gaining energy. And he gave this example of world-renowned martial artist. And he was a Westerner. And he was competing against people who have grown up in that culture of martial arts in China and wherever, learning from the time they were maybe three years old. His energy levels were off the charts. It just, he, he didn't get tired and he was sharing his secret in an interview. And it was simply this, I don't use energy, I generate energy. So as I'm doing my kickboxing or whatever, I know that I'm, uh, I'm generating more and more energy, like a power plant. So that is a mind shift that actually changes the physics of your body because you really do, through your mindset and your beliefs, start generating energy instead of depleting it. I think I now, now that you mentioned it, I did hear that from him. And it's, I think that may have been where the follow-up quote was like, if you're tired, go do something. Right. We just did a little exercise before starting the recording where we did a little uh, breathing exercise. And I feel much more energetic, energized and energetic after doing that. I didn't do that. I, this is my third interview uh, this morning. <laughs> so um, the other two, I didn't do that. But for whatever reason, I'm like, let's do the, uh, you know, this non-breathing exercise. And he's like, no, <laughs> let's do it. It creates energy, but it relaxes you at the same time. Yeah, it's grounding. It's really good. It's just very simple. I probably went over this a couple of times on this podcast, but I'll, I'll fill in the listener who isn't aware of it. You breathe in and then a little more and then a little more and keep holding it and then tap your fingertips on your upper chest. Keep tapping, 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 keep holding and... <sighs> Let it all out, pull it out in your, your mouth. And uh, if you want, do it one more time. And it's awesome. It's really, really cool. That's amazing that that little thing can do that. But that's yeah, it's so cool. That's why we're here. We're here we are, we're here for the hacks. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So I had to have you on the show to tell your story. I just was blown away by it. I'm so excited to finally be doing this because I've told at least 10 people <laughs> what happened uh, with you and that it's coming. It's coming. It's going to be on a pot on my podcast. Uh, so you'll be able to hear the whole story, but it is just mind blowing. It's, it's one of those kind of glitch in the matrix moments. Like, but is this reality real? And so can you share the story that you shared with me when we uh, first met in a Zoom breakout at JVMM, Joint Venture Mastermind, which we're both uh, members of? I was at a, I went to Hoffman Institute, which is basically a week-long retreat where you go, you, you're not allowed to turn on phones, you're not allowed to communicate with the outside world. It's just you and you're, and you're there to deal with uh, you know, try to get rid of uh, negative love habits you receive as a child. And there's all kinds of different exercises there. It was really incredible. People come in anonymously, use nicknames. Uh, we had some major stars in our group. There's about 40 people there. I'm not the one who recognized them, but other people are like, hey, that's so-and-so. It's like, you know, but, <laughs> so, um, but it was really, really interesting. And, you know, for me, I grew up pseudo normal family but my dad was always hard on me I was the oldest one not I mean we I got spanked sometimes but it was mostly kind of mental just um you know I, 
could argue was abuse. So we explored a lot of that stuff at this event, and it's you know really highly recommended. Probably most people will, <clears throat> will never spend a week like that without their phones, without communication ever in their, their lifetime. Again, I thought that at the time. I thought, geez, this is great, you know. And there were some times where you would you go, you know, we were it was exercises until late at night. Some meals you'd go to, and they'd say, "You can. This is a silent meal. You can't talk to anybody. You've got to absorb what you just did in the exercise, and so forth." So anyway, um, one of the exercises was they uh, they said, "Okay, we want you to." Th and this is like on a Tuesday, I'll say it was Friday to Friday. So by Tuesday, we'd kind of gotten done a lot of meditating, a lot of, of guided meditations, um, exercises, and so forth. And they said, "We want you to think about a to go back to a time when you're." around eight years old that you were really in trauma you know you felt trauma in your life as a child for me and it, I, I had suppressed probably this memory for a long time but I, I sat there and, and, and I, in fact then I, that night I wrote it all down but basically it was I was in our living room and I could see myself I could see uh, my mom still lives in the house the the table I could see where it is um, I had popped off in the living room by myself. Family was either in the family room, kitchen, or outside, you know, different, different places. I was, I'm the oldest of three. And I had just kind of gotten the, another, you know, consistent tongue lashing for whatever. And it was just kind of, you know, I see it now. And you and I talked about why that was probably, we'll get to that later. But I, I sat down at that table and I remember thinking, you know, oh my God, what am I going to do? I, I can't live like this. This is just miserable. I get blamed for everything. I get screamed at, yelled at, constantly on edge. You know, you never knew if my dad was going to be mad when he came home. And, you know, he was always going to be yelling at me for something. And so at that moment, you know, I, I just sat at the living room table and was just thinking, and I was serious faced probably, but inside I was just crying and, and just beside myself. And, you know, this whole exercise let me kind of let those emotions out. And that was the point of the exercise itself. And I recalled, you know, it probably was like a 30 minute sit. And I was sitting, what are my options? What, you know, I can't live like this. What are my options? Can I run away? No, because how would I even survive? I was just, you know, that didn't make any, and I was a super logical person, by the way, and I still am, but, you know, so that, that didn't make any sense. But I, you know, I, I went back to that two or three times. I could run away. I could go hide, you know, our street was kind of in the woods. I could go hide at the power plant at the end of the street and, you know, what would make a shag? No, that doesn't work. Uh, you know, I could commit suicide, right? And I'm like, well, that, screw that he would win uh, there's not even a chance i'm doing that that's not happening but you know i kept going through these options third option maybe i go live with my cousins um could i do that you know how would i even do that what would be the and you know but i had all these friends that i loved in my neighborhood and i'm like i would lose all those friends because i'd be gone that doesn't seem to work and i kept going and there might have been one or two others in there but i kept going through this rotation just like there's no there's no answer I, I, what's the answer can somebody help me and at that moment, a voice came in my head and said, everything's going to be all right. And I love you. You know, at the time I'm thinking, you know, I, I said, well, you know, I'm trying to think, well, did I manufacture this? What, what is this? And I said, well, who are you? And the voice said, I am you. You know, I, I kind of dwelled in that. I, I recall dwelling on that and thinking, well, is this enough for me to get through? And then I decided, okay, I got up and just went about my day and played and whatever I did. And I hadn't thought about that, you know, maybe once or twice in my life since then, but this exercise did that. So, okay, great. So that night I actually wrote it out. So what do you mean say this, this exercise did that? So the instructor... No, uh, so they just said, hey, go back to a time, think about it. You don't have to say it out loud or anything. Think about that. And I recalled that. So we were kind of in this guided meditation and he had, he had brought this up. All right. And I hadn't thought about that moment in my life, maybe once or twice since that happened, but I recalled it vividly in this moment. So that's okay. That's Tuesday. That happened. Great. There's, that was some point in my life that something happened on two days later on Thursday, we're. We're back in the main area, and I remember the instructor's name was was Steve, and he said, "Okay, everybody, shut your eyes." And we had done all these different things. There was no, there was no like progressive. We had kind of tabled that. We had tabled everything. We just, all these exercises are put in a certain order, and he said, "Shut your eyes," and I want you to go back to a time when you were eight years old and you were in distress. I'm like, "Well, that's easy," because the one I identified a couple days ago was this. 
particular incident. And he said, now I want you to just, just look at your childhood self there and observe what's happening. And I'm, so, you know, we've got our eyes shut. I'm visualizing this. I'm looking down at the table at my eight-year-old self who's in distress and is just sitting there beside himself. You, you know, from my view, I can see the tears, whether that's inside the, my eight-year-old self or not. And so this instructor, Steve, says, okay, you've observed all that. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell your eight-year-old self everything's going to be okay and that you love them. And I'm like, I'm kind of, you know, I'm in, so we're in this guided meditation and my eyes are lighting up with my eyelids shut and I'm kind of like trying to look around, you know, I'm not looking around, I've got my eyes shut, but I'm kind of like thinking anybody else just experienced what I experienced. And then he, then he says, okay, now tell your childhood self that you, who you are. And basically in you know, my story that was like, well, who are you? And I, I said, I am you. I was like, oh my gosh, what, what was that? Now, here's where my logical side takes in. Cause I'm like. I went back through this this sequence of events trying to figure out if somehow I planted, you know, or, or somehow it was caused or they could have created this this anomaly or this coincidence. And there was no way that I could figure it out. I had recalled the story on my own, told nobody about it, went through it vividly in this exercise, even wrote about it in journaling that night. Two days later, he's telling me to go back to my childhood self. And I didn't know that he was going to tell us to say that, but he told us to say, you know, everything's going to be all right. And I love you. Even just one of those alone, I might've been, well, it's, you know, kind of generic. So that might've, but the two sentences in a row, the exact way that I had recalled hearing them as an eight-year-old prior. And I, you know, and it, you could have, if you reverse the order of these events, you would say, well, he fed me that info and that's how I remembered it. But I remembered it first. Yeah, and even then he, down. I, yes. And then he fed me the lines to deliver to my eight year old self two days later when I had already recalled what the lines were. That blew me away. Yeah. And so that's what I told you in that uh, Zoom room the one day, you know, really off topic for a, a digital <laughs> marketing networking meeting. But that was, I forget if they told us to talk about books or something. When we no, no, no. What, what happened was I had started by sharing a little bit of my story. And then we had the question, whatever the question was to answer. But I had said that I'm working on a book about how you know, we're, we're essentially living in the matrix and everything is an illusion. And, and you're like, oh, well, here's a crazy story you're going to like. <laughs> I, and I liked it very, very much. I mean, case <laughs> gave me goosebumps and everything. It's like, that's the confirmation from the angels or angel bumps. And I'm like, ooh, yep, <laughs> that's real. <laughs> love, 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 love that. Well, and I think that's that's the way it would have to be delivered to me to take that step you know into believing the matrix and so forth because i'm this also you know I, i've kind of got this balance but i've always been the super logical guy and i was so if if there was any way that i could misinterpret that or that it could have been caused by something they did or something i did then i was going to find that and i could not find that you know and then of course i talked to you and your next comment was, well, way do you learn your relationship with your dad was part of a soul contract? I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. So we got to talk you more. And of course I watched, you know, listen to some of your episodes. There were, it was one specific episode on soul contracts, but um, you know, I had another one before that, that now I look back on, I'm like, you know, that's not so strange and probably not an anomaly. And, and this one's, e you know, easier to kind of just say, Oh, that's, he made it up in his head, but you know, we, my son, he was born in 2011. You know, we were about two and a half months out before he was going to be born. And I was already having nightmares of fearfulness for him, right? But we knew he was going to be Ray the Fourth. We knew that he was a boy. I had a dream one night and I, we were at my mom's house. So the house I grew up in, and I, I came out and I said, you know, I came out of the front door and I'm like, oh my God, where's Ray? And I'm looking around for him. You know, I couldn't find him. I mean, just the fear of a father already starting before he's born. And he came, he crawled out from under a car in the driveway where we would normally park a car. And he said, I'm okay, Papa. And, and he just walked and he, you know, he's supposed to be a baby. I didn't, I hadn't met him yet, at least in the physical world. And uh, when he was, but that's how he talks now. That same voice I heard and the way he calls me Papa, that's exactly what how he talks. Now, we could have subliminal, you know, whatever taught him to talk that way. I don't know. Subconsciously taught him to talk that way. But that was a weird one for me, too, because it was like, 
I talked to him and, you know, I didn't think much of it. And then when he started talking at about, you know, a year old, he talked exactly like I had heard in that dream. So those are the like two events for me that are like, okay, there's way more of all this than everybody thinks. Wow. Thank you for, for sharing that. Yes. Powerful stories, powerful stories. And, and do you find that uh, the, the concept of soul contracts or that everything is so kind of precisely divinely orchestrated, do you find that to be comforting? Do you find it to be kind of discombobulating or uh, some other like, emotion? I would say it's definitely more comforting than discombobulating. It's kind of surprising at first, like what? And then is it mm. is it just me who who has the you know these events? I would say yeah, it was it was discombobulating, but in a uh, the, that the first story definitely in a good way. The second story didn't manifest itself for a couple of years from when I had the dream, but I always remembered like just so you know he because in my dream he was just a tiny baby he had just been born and we couldn't find him. So he wouldn't talk, he wouldn't crawl, but he crawled out from under a car, stood up, said, I'm right here, you know, I'm okay, Papa. And I'm like, late, and it, it didn't kind of put two, I always remembered the dream, I didn't put two and two together until he started talking. I'm like, he talks just like I heard. You know, obviously that one's harder to prove to the audience that that's something that happened, but uh yeah, for me, I, I think it's comforting that there's more there and that, uh, you know, I got, I've been lucky enough to discover it or witness it. Mm -hmm. for myself and you know you can only think you can only go so far probably when you hear somebody else's story but when it happens to you and then it's like well you know I, I do my best when I'm whether I want something to be true or not I do my best to disprove it and just to, to test it and uh, you know I couldn't do that with for myself with either of those well I found that a lot more miracles happen in my life when I have the willing suspension of disbelief so if I put on that that uh, skeptic's, skeptic's cap, I've uh, blocked my connection with the upper world, and I've started to manifest the lack of miracles. <laughs> so the willing suspension of disbelief has been a, a, an incredible hack in my life that has opened the floodgates to lots of miracles, lots of without a doubt signs and crazy coincidences that you can't kind of reason away. Yeah, and for me, I mean, just being a logical person, I just like you know, I, I'm not trying intentionally to disbelieve something, but I, one of my ways of convincing myself that's is real is by, okay, well, what if I was the devil's advocate? What, what are the things I could poke holes in this with? And I do that, you know, if I'm give, we're back to you know, if I'm buying a course, it's like you know, what are the failure points for me as the person taking this course or you know or a better question and maybe this is more of a positive one is now i measure everything it's like if i'm going to do a program how many days is it going to take me to make my money back if this program works like it says and usually i believe it can because you know i know my audience and i know my skill sets can i get this money back and 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 so the same with these events it's kind of like okay if i can logically not poke any holes in this then i then it then i know it's true we did a, uh, after this Hoffman, you get one, you know, follow-up call with a coach to see how you're doing. And so I did it about a month later and I was selling a business at that time and having trouble. Unfortunately, I sold it to a lawyer who was playing games and I was just frustrated. I said, I don't know how to deal with this. And the coach is like, well, I, I want you to, you know, shut your eyes and your 85 year old self is visiting you now. And what is he saying? And I said, <laughs> he's saying, this is, this is nothing. It's a blip. You know, it's a bump in the road. You're not going to care about this months from now. And that was the honest truth. And it was even if just logically in my head, I'm like, you know, he's right. But taking the view from that, you know, the visit from my, you know, I have no doubt at some some point when I'm 85, somebody's going to say, hey, go visit your <laughs> younger self when you were selling that business. I know that'll happen now. <laughs> I don't know how, but it will. So that is awesome. I love that. <laughs> That reminds me of a book I've just started reading recently. It's called Be Your Future Self Now. It's by Dr. Benjamin Hardy. He's going to be on this podcast. Uh, we've got a booking for a few months from now to do the interview. Great guy. He's the author of Willpower Doesn't Work, Personality Isn't Permanent. He's co-author of Who Not How and of Gap, The Gap in the Game. Super smart guy. So be your future self now is about how to be your future self now and how to not just kind of channel your future self and like, what would my future self do? 
uh, in this situation or you know let's fast forward into the future what would be the response from that future self uh, version of me no you actually tele telepathically communicate with your future self i got it right here <laughs> in fact i'm going after this i'm going on a, a lunch appointment i'm giving a copy to somebody who used to back in the day was always trying to teach me that and uh, i said i got to get him a copy of this book but i learned about the book i think from that meeting in the spring mm. you guys were all talking about it uh, one thing i want to share that's a fun story that relates to what you were sharing 20 it was early 2013 and i was at a seminar run by donnie epstein it's called Ultimatum, and he's an energy healer, worker. Yeah, he's amazing. He's uh, also the founder of Network Chiropractic or Network Spinal Analysis. He's a whole branch of, of chiropractic that's more kind of energy work than cracking and adjusting. I'm laying on the chiropractic table, getting an entrainment from Donnie, and I'm just like, somewhere else. I'm blissed out. <laughs> I'm in another dimension or something. After the entrainment's finished, I can't really get up. I'm too out of it. I get picked up by a, a group of attendees and laid on the floor on the carpet. So I'm just flying high and I decide I'm going to start blessing people. I get the intuitive message that the thing I learned how to do in India five months earlier that turned me from agnostic to believer in God and connected to, to him and to everything, was getting touched on the head by a monk and having a psychedelic trip from that, just getting a blessing from a monk. I've never done drugs, and so this was quite an unusual experience for me to see everything in technicolor like a cartoon and have this deep sense of connection and peace. And like, it was heavenly. It was otherworldly. Uh, I learned later at that seminar, it was a Tony Robbins event in India uh, where his high level platinum partners who pay a lot of money. And I was <laughs> paying a lot of money to Tony for uh, being part of that program. That's, that was the trip. It was called uh, the oneness trip and uh, changed my life. So I got the download while I'm blissed out on the floor after uh, getting an entrainment five months later at Donnie's event that I could give a remote diksha or oneness blessing. I don't have to actually touch a person on the head. So I started blessing people. And one of the people that I blessed was a guy I hadn't thought of for 15 years who used to work for me. And I fired him on the spot after I heard that he was talking smack about me behind my back. And I was very butthurt over it because <laughs> I was full of ego and I didn't like that uh, he, he did that. And I wanted to make an example of him and pack up his stuff and walk him off the property. And everybody was like jaws <laughs> like down on the ground watching this unfolds. Uh, then he files a, a, a frivolous lawsuit against me because uh, I had the right to do this as a work at will state. Even though it wasn't the nicer right thing to do, it was perfectly legal. Turns out it's actually cheaper to settle a lawsuit that you're going to win <laughs> a lot of times than it is to win it. So I eventually gave in and um, settled after my lawyer's like, you know, you're just wasting money here. Okay, you'll win, but f to what end? Just settle and move on. So then the guy disappears from my life for 15 years. I never hear his name ever again. I never see him again, even though we live in the same town for a number of years, completely gone off the face of the earth. Until that moment where I'm blissed out on the floor 15 years later, and I think of him and I send him a blessing. Guess who calls me on my cell phone to apologize four days later? Wow. This stuff's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a game. Yeah, right. It's like a like this this life we're living is is like an incredible, beautiful, miraculous video game. I had a um a guy on I interviewed for a summit, I guess two weeks ago now. A friend of mine, we've been in a coaching group together for years. I didn't even know what he did. And I said, let's get on a call and I said, you know, he does I guess, you know, I, I putting people in trances and hypnosis to help them mental barriers, all that kind of stuff. But he did a little session on me and it was just kind of you know shutting your eyes get trying to get your vibration right in your body and he did it during the actual summit so it's in the you know it's in the people watch that interview it's in there and i got done with the interview i had to but it was about just getting your mindset around and he said you know you can take the slow route which is law of attraction right 
or you can get your body in vibration. You can kind of force your way to get to where you want to be and all this stuff. This could all be coincidence, but we're, you know, where I said, well, I, he said, let's talk about, you know, shut your eyes, get you feel the inside of your hand, the inside of your right foot, left hand, right hand, left foot. We did all these things for about 18 minutes and I'm driving to the, to a annual doctor's appointment because I don't, I don't get out much anymore, you know, working from home, but, and you know, I get there and there's like three different emails with money in them mm-hmm. coming in and I'm like, ah, this stuff. Okay. I got to explore this more too. I mean, this stuff really works. And, uh, you know, for me, it's back when we first started talking about the, this whole, my story and intuition, you know, I had some epiphanies that like my, my goals are all wrong. And my goals are really to be working from home and, and spending time with my kids while they still like me, you know, while they're still before they're teenagers, they're 11 and eight. And, uh, then I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm in the, I'm in the perfect business. I'm in the perfect world. I don't need these other goals that everything else will just happen if I'm doing what I want to be doing. Reminds me of a Kabbalistic teaching. So from in Kabbalah, there's this concept of, uh, the light and the, the white light contains, of course, all the colors. And if you imagine a prism and the white light is uh, flowing into or or shining into the prism, and then all the different colors are uh, broken out on the other side, a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people are chasing after individual colors, health, um, relationship, career, business, wealth, etc. And when they chase after the individual colors, they tended to let the other areas of their life slip or become less awesome. And and instead, the secret isn't to try and balance all of them. It's to simply chase after the white light because it contains all the colors. And when you do that, everything comes along for the ride. Every miracle or opportunity or benefit is built into chasing after the white light, which is simply uh, another way of saying, get closer to God. That was his first hack too. Uh, last couple of weeks ago, he said, "You know, I said, what's give it? Start us off with a hack for being successful in your business or attracting wealth." And he said, "Get closer to God." So I, you know, I feel like I'm a just dip my toe in the pond, and of course, this conversation takes me another step forward. Yeah, and well, he did ask for some coaching. So, <laughs> uh, speaking of which, you know, this relates to what you were saying with about the. Um, uh, get closer to God thing. Another one of my guests, he's a breathwork expert. I know him and another mastermind I'm in called Metal. His name is Curtis Thomas. He mentioned just in passing in the interview something that just like jumped out at me and it changed it changed my life. Like this was meant for me. He said, yeah, oh, no, I, I did something uh, you know, recently where I made God my business partner and all these amazing things have happened. What? He's like, what? <laughs> you made God your business partner. Tell me more about that. He said that another friend did this and it's inspired him. So he gave it a try and it's changed everything for him. And it's, I mean, you're not assuming that God is going to be your business partner. You actually ask, he'll say yes, as long as it's not like uh, <laughs> running a crack house or something. Everything gets easier. The synchronicities just accelerate and just, it's incredible. So that, I did that best year ever out of the last, uh, for this business, my previous business that I, I sold uh, was back in 2010. But for this business, the last 12 years of running it, this is the best year ever, you know, revenue wise. So that's small testament to the power of letting go and letting God, but also of seeing yourself as a collaborator and co-creator and not like this is just me hustling and 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 hard slogging it you know gary v is all about the hustle but that's not how you have a 10x or 100x breakthrough it's by making god your business partner or your life partner in in a co-collaborator in in life wow is there a manual on how to do that it's very simple you just ask just him. Ask. You feel like you're getting a yes, and then it's done. So a, a simple exercise I uh, learned this just from listening to God is just to ask God if he's there. You can do it out loud or you can do it in your head. Either way, he hears you. There are no private thoughts, by the way. <laughs> I mentioned that to somebody in a in a Zoom breakout one day. I mentioned it to a group, and then this one guy just like got really defensive about it. And he's like, that's terrifying. 
<laughs> anyway, so I'm uh, learning how to do this by, by just listening to God. And it's simply this. Ask God, are you there? God, are you there? Chances are if uh, you have the connection, at least even a crack open, you'll feel a yes or you'll hear a yes kind of in your inner voice or you'll just get a sense of a yes because he's always there. Even if we're completely disconnected and we hear nothing, feel nothing, see nothing in our mind's eye, he's still there. He's still answering yes. We just are blocked or blocking the reception of it. So if we can hear that in some sense, kind of like, I just heard a yes, but that's no, there's no way that's God. That's just my own head. <laughs> well, set that aside. That's the disbelief. Set that aside for a second. And then just be in the, in, in the awe of, wow, I just got a confirmation that from God. Maybe I made it up or whatever, but I'm going to set that aside for a minute the willing suspension of disbelief. If you want to get confirmation because you're not really sure that was God, um, one thing I've learned uh, as part of like discernment is to ask a follow-up question if you're getting information like, oh, I'm supposed to bring this book up or uh, recommend a particular seminar to this person, or in your case, recommend the soul contracts episode. I, I ask for confirmation. And the simple kind of truth test on that is, are you of the light? If you don't hear anything back, then it wasn't of the light. They're not going to say, no, <laughs> well, you got me. Okay. No, it's just going to be crickets, silence. So then, you know, oh, I just almost got fooled. And that's happened. That's happened where they, they almost got me. <laughs> like the, whoever was trying to fool me almost fooled me. So yeah, that that's a very powerful exercise. I've done that with some people and they're like, wow, I had no idea I could speak to God and actually hear him or, or feel him or sense him and get an answer. Amazing. Right. And that dovetails with your intuition. So it's like, oh, I feel like I'm, I shouldn't go to work today. This is really weird. I don't feel weird. I don't, and I don't feel sick. I don't know. Like against logic, trying to figure out a way not to go to work today. What's going on with that? And then, you know, some terrible accident happens or something. And, and either you, listen to your intuition and you avoided that accident or you went anyways and then you got in the accident. Uh, I need to listen to my intuition more. But this is a way to confirm that. It's like, okay, I'm going to ask God about this. I feel like I'm supposed to turn right today instead of left. And normally I follow my intuition, but this is going to really make me late for a very important meeting. Can you please confirm that this is what I'm supposed to do? Uh, okay, got a yes. All right, I'll do it. I'll just let them know I'm going to be late. Eye-opening stuff, man. I tell you. I got a lot of walk away exercises here to start implementing. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the intuition code, because you've got a whole book about intuition, which might for some folks seem like a, a little and before they knew, you know, your stories and stuff you might think, well, how is that related to being the summit guy all about online summits and all about doing anthologies and getting business books onto the wall street journal bestseller list and stuff like that how does that relate to a book about intuition yeah good question something told me to do it one of the things we've done is and this is how i got my you know i, I my first book 2015 walking by a book a booth at infusionsoft and saw a booth that said, hey, you can co you can write a chapter and be in a book with Jack Canfield. And I said, I am never going to get this done. It's always going to be on my to-do list unless I commit to it. We talked about this earlier, right? So committing financially, I said, I'm going to go ahead and get, it was a big, it was like seven grand or something to write a chapter in that book. And I said, that will make me get it done because I'm not wasting that money. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that. And the experience was so rewarding because it just, it gave me enough confidence to start doing it on my own. You know, next thing I know, you know, a year or so later, I'm, people are just by word of mouth, I'm helping them launch books all from just kind of taking that chance and saying, I've always wanted to write a book. Here's my chance. I'm going to do that. And so that stuck with me that that was a great way for other people to learn. So my list, you know, I'm a, I'm a summit guy, but my list is pretty strongly influenced by authors or wannabe authors or aspiring authors. This was an easy way to do it. You know, when you're going to go write your own book and everybody should, um, but you got to find a cover artist and you got to figure out how to evaluate what's, what you, you know, what the, if the cover looks good and what you want, there's a lot of people to start out, do their own cover. 
uh, interior editing, formatting, publishing, marketing, writing descriptions, all that stuff. That, that's just the, any one of those can stop someone in the track. So we do it really just to help people get their first book out. Or we've got a lot of repeat clients that come back and they're like that adds books to their portfolio and they can say the author of multiple books. And so we started doing that, but, and, and most of them of that particular series, we've got a code series. So it's like, there's the success code, happiness code, wealth code, um, entrepreneur code. So we had the four there. We've also got one coming out after the intuition code called the habits code, but the intuition code came up. I was just in a mastermind that I run and we were talking about things and somebody brought up something along these lines, kind of like what happened with you and I, right? And then I said, you know, here's this story that happened to me. And in fact, it all kind of happened within probably a month to six weeks before you and I had the conversation on Zoom. This is when this happened. I told the story and I said, you know, I've, I've been thinking about just adding a kind of an offshoot, you know, the intuition code to this series because that would include more authors from my audience. So we've got, you know, if you're into success, you could be on the success code. If you're into like, if you're a happiness person, if you're into wealth building and so forth, you could be on the wealth code. So why not have one that's more spiritual, if you will, or, and, you know, I thought about it and then, but the, the reaction was like one or two people right away, like, I want to be in that book. And I said, okay, let's, let's do it. It's okay to me if it's smaller than our normal books. I don't think it turned out that way. I think it's about average, but so interestingly, and you know, you and I are talking offline. I mean, I had somebody yesterday saying, oh, I should be in that book, you know? So there's a lot of people, more people out there when you just kind of present the idea to the universe that they'll, they'll sh come out of the woodwork and you get to hear more stories. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, that's coming out and that's been really fun because, and, and what I did was I recorded my story that I just told you, and that was my sales video. It kind of allowed, you know, the, just having the book allowed me to one, tell my story to share it on the sales page. You know, it's great. And we, we do a lot of, I, I just sent a book to my old track coach from high school Yet last night, we have another series called the Inc. series. We've got Author Inc., Coaching Inc. In Coaching Inc., I wrote a story about my senior year in a track meet, and he basically, you know, I had become good friends with my rival, and I kept losing to him. And he said, he told me to quit hugging that guy before the race. <laughs> and I, I talk about that basically the stories of my chapters about the internal strife of doing that because I'm non confrontational. I don't like conflict. And it was kind of like, you know, you ever hug somebody who's mad at you and they keep their arms at their side. I mean, that was how I, I hugged him before this meet. And then, uh, you know, I ate his lunch in the conference meet and finally beat him twice uh, in the relay and the, the regular 800 <laughs> meter because I followed the coach's advice and I was coachable. But anyway, I wanted to And then to you became lifelong story. enemies or something, right? <laughs> right. I haven't talked to him since. Uh, <laughs> he threw a water bottle at me in jest after the meet. But I wanted my coach to remember or to know that I, I think of that to this day, but that was like the a dominant story in my head. And I'm like, this is a great way for me to get it out. And so that's why, you know, it's great having you and your wife on there. And, and the amazing thing about these books is everybody really crushes it when they're writing one chapter and one story. I, I love doing it. So that's why we do it. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful to be in, in that book with a chapter and for my wife, Ryan, to be in there too. It's really cool. So thank you. And uh, when you were talking about your, your track coach, it reminded me of kind of a corollary, or maybe it's the opposite of that. It's like, stop hugging your, your, your buddy and, and actually beat him. There's something called the Ben Franklin effect, where Ben Franklin had a, like a mortal enemy, somebody who just wanted Ben to be dead. And it was like a political rival. And uh, he was just making Ben's life really hard. So what Ben does is he borrows a book from this guy. He knows that this guy has a very expensive book collection and he borrows from or asks to borrow one of his most expensive <laughs> books, most rare books. And he, and, and the guy agrees. Ben returns it promptly, like three days later with a thank you note, anger or, or the bitterness or whatever it was from this other guy just kind of started to dissipate and then they eventually became friends because it's a cognitive dissonance to say, well, I hate this person, but I'm going to loan them something that's treasured and very valuable to get rid of that cognitive dissonance. One of those two things needs to be not true. And that's the, well, this guy's my enemy. You wouldn't loan your treasured possessions to your enemy. Have you heard this before? No. I, I know we're out of time here, but I, I wanted to share two real quick things with you and get your, your thoughts on them. One is one of my very early episodes 
on this show uh, was uh, Bill Donius was the guest. He's an expert on something called non-dominant handwriting. Uh, I'd never heard of this before, but I attended a mastermind event and he was one of the speakers. And it's to use your non-dominant hand, if you're right-handed, it's your left hand, which accesses the right hemisphere of your brain, which you don't normally do when you're uh, writing normally in the same way that you would if you're uh, using your non-dominant. Uh, it still works to uh, be left-handed and then use your right hand in this exercise. But in this session that he taught, he had us close our eyes. Well, first write like a, a totem animal or an animal that we really connect with. And I wrote zebra down. So that was just normal. And then he said, okay, close your eyes, move your pen to your non-dominant hand, uh, squeeze the pen in your hand, kind of feel like you're resetting things in your brain. You know, quieting your mind and and then whenever you're ready don't worry about penmanship or anything just answer this question and don't speak it in your in your head or anything just let your hand do what it's going to do and the question of course again was what's your totem animal or what's, what's what's the animal you most relate to and i wrote something completely different i wrote humpback whale i think blue whale or humpback whale it just felt true on a much deeper level to me after i looked at those two scribbles, <laughs> one much more like my handwriting and the other not so. The non-dominant hand knows my true nature much better than my uh, normal kind of egoic self does. I do like to show off and be different and kind of stand out in a crowd. So the, the zebra made a lot of sense on a superficial level, but my heart, my soul is much more aligned with the humpback whale. Did you ever, ever hear of this um, this sort of thing? No. He would have been a great uh, like a, a contributor to the intuition code to, to layer in that exercise or that technique as another way to access your intuition. Oh, well, book's already done. <laughs> well, when you host a summit on it, you... Oh, yeah, we're going to have... Yeah, that's gotta... right. I, I want to host a, a, a summit on, on intuition. Yeah, yeah. Well, it'd be great. I mean, it's just... Obviously, you've got all these in your library anyway, yeah. but uh, it's a great way to showcase some of these these ideas. That's uh, I'm gonna. I guess I don't know if I can try the exercise myself now that I've heard it. But did you write down an uh, a, an animal just normally? Yeah. Okay. Did you you didn't do the other hand yet though? Well, I was starting to write the same animal. To be honest, but well, there's no there's no right or wrong answer. It's totally fine. Try it again. But this time, close your eyes, kind of squeeze the pen in your hand, and, and your non-dominant hand. Are you right-handed? Yeah. Okay, so in your left hand, squeeze, kind of reset, that that resets your, your brain to not have any preconceived notions, and you're just in flow, and let your right brain take control of the hand and write whatever it's going to write whenever you're ready. And you can keep your eyes closed for this, or... or... Oh, I, I actually did it as you were talking, so... Okay. Would you write same thing, same animal? No, but I, it's, <laughs> it sounds too much like you. I, I went from lion to dolphin. I don't know. Oh, I like dolphin it. Dolphin popped in my head. I like it. I, I don't know because usually if you tell me to pick an animal, it's lion. I'm a Leo, you know, yeah. born in July, late July. But so, yeah, yeah, that was odd because you, as you were saying it, I'm like, wait, something. You know, I'm like, well, if it's lion, it's lion, and that popped in. Mm -hmm. I like it. I like it. Now you're you're. You're a badass dolphin. I'm going to have to read about dolphins. I mean, to me, it's like, like to be in, in groups of like-minded people, like to be with smart people, kind of, you know, laid back. I mean, I don't know. There's, I've seen different shows on dolphins where they're mm -hmm. battling sharks. but Oh, they're so the smart. Part, yeah, they're so smart. And yeah, they're very just, uh, kind. I remember the story of a guy who jumped off a bridge. Maybe it was the, the Brooklyn Bridge or San Francisco Bay Bridge or something. It was, it was a common spot for people to commit suicide. And there was a dolphin underneath him. He was drowned. He, was, he didn't die immediately. Well, he actually lived, um, and it was the dolphin that saved him. He decided uh, once he hit the water and probably broke a bunch of bones and stuff that, uh, no, I, I want to live. I changed my mind. And then a dolphin just swoops up from under him, pushes him up to be able to breathe because he didn't have any energy to or means to, to support himself up above the water to, to get air. Kept him up above the, the water line to breathe for however many minutes it took until uh, rescue came. Wow. 
dolphins are really plugged in. Now, there's one thing I want to coach you on <laughs> that I'm like, when I heard it, I'm like, okay, I'm writing this one down and I'm not letting them get away with that. <laughs> uh, you said, while my kids still like me. No, <laughs> stop manifesting a crappy future for yourself. But I, I, I didn't challenge you at the moment. I just let you finish your thought. But I, I, I had to come back to that one. Yeah, th- I, I would say that's a slang. In fact, I don't usually describe it that way. Yeah. But mostly that they right now they still want to hug and kiss me, and uh, I don't. I think they'll always like me. They will. Um, they will. But don't say something that's against that because. Your thoughts and your words are very powerful. Your words manifest your reality. And and your subconscious mind does not have a sense of humor. You think, oh, I'm being flippant or self-deprecating. Isn't that funny? Uh, no, you're speaking it into existence. Good tip. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have yeah. a feeling, I have a really strong intuition on this, that your kids are still going to want to hug and kiss you uh, when you're... Uh, old and curmudgeonly well mostly i'm thinking about their teen years but i I, you know i still don't see any signs of it yet you know we're homeschooling doing some things different so well you also chose them and they chose you right if you if you buy into the soul contract thing which we talked about at the beginning of the episode you guys made a contract like ray the fourth chose you and you chose him. You know, I've thought about that a lot since we first had the very first conversation. I said, you know, that I believe that, that, that my contract with my dad was so that I could have this contract with my son and, and my daughter. So that's the way it feels because it's like that's my dream is to have the relationship that I have now. And uh, it's happened. So there's some reason for that. Ray, I, uh, I know we're way over time, but I just love talking with you and you're just such a, such a bright light in the world. You too, man. I'm so blessed that we met. Could have easily just passed and said, well, you're an SEO guy over in this world. And I'm kind of with the smaller business author types. And yet just a, just a single kind of exchange. You made this big connection where you're the, you know, one of the people that I'm most happy to see on our group calls and of course co-authoring a book together podcast together so it's it's been great and I believe me I take note of everything all the advice you've given and that's that was the goal too you asked me offline I said that's to learn as much as I can from you so thank you very much well thank you and and thank you for everything that you do for for others you really are heart-centered and and other focused and that shows and the universe rewards that. Speaking of being other focused, uh, listener, do something really out of character for you, outside your comfort zone. It will make somebody feel so loved. And we'll catch you on the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off. <laughs>